It's time for In the Money, stock market action on AMA 20 News. Here's Chief Market Strategist Gareth Sotaway from InTheMoneyStocks.com. Good afternoon, everyone. As always, a pleasure to be here with you on this Sunday, March 9th, 2014. I'm here, as always, to help the average investor learn how to trade the markets, whether they are going up or down. Doesn't matter, folks. Up or down, 5%, 10% up, 5 10% down. You should be in a position where you can always make money. All right, Wall Street has an agenda, and the agenda is to manipulate you into being on the wrong side of the markets. But you have to stop being aloof about this game. Stop being illiterate when it comes to the markets. Just start learning how to read the charts. Once you do that, it's easy, folks. And again, you know, it doesn't mean you're going to be right 100% of the time. No one's 100% right. But the key is put yourself always on the right side. And then overall, you will continue to profit. So again, welcome aboard here today on this Sunday, March 9th, 2014. My name is Gareth Soloway, Chief Market Strategist at, at uh, InTheMoneyStocks.com. I'm joined today by a special guest, Nick Santiago, my business partner at InTheMoneyStocks.com. Uh, he's a Chief Market Strategist and expert on cycles, among many, many other things. And he's going to be telling us a little bit about his views today. So how are you doing, Nick? Oh, very good, Gareth. Thanks for having me today. Oh, it's always a pleasure. Anytime. So basically today, folks, what we want to do is just go over, you know, the basics of last week. I want to focus in on what truly went on. And I always say this to you guys, but it's important to know that what you see on the financial media out there is not necessarily the truth about what is going on. And to make an important decision about your financial future, where to put your money, you have to really know the underlying factors of what's driving the market, because that is what will tell you the truth true direction about where things are going to go. So again, what I want to do today, folks, is go over last week's market action, discuss what's going on there. I want to look at the coming week market action. All right, so what are we looking for this week in the markets? Where are the markets most likely to go? We also want to go over last week's trade alerts and decide and look and see which one uh, worked out, which ones did not, and how much money will be donated to charity. Remember, for every trade that I am not correct on, I will be donating $100 to charity. Also, later in the show, this is special, folks. Uh, we have a special guest on the show, Martin Armstrong from ArmstrongEconomics.com. He's renowned as being one of the leading economists willing to talk the truth about the Federal Reserve economics and government policy, and he will join us a little bit later in the hour. So big things to come today. Uh, I also want to touch on Bitcoin. Uh, we saw, um, a, sadly, a suicide, it believed to be, last week by one of the main players at one of the exchanges for Bitcoin. And this is just in a long string of of heartaches for Bitcoin, and I want to discuss what it means. Is it, you know, some conspiracy going on out there to kind of shut the currency down that could be a rival to the yen, to the dollar, or is it just a sad kind of beginning way of a new potential internet currency? So we'll talk about that as well as go over tactics and educational pieces to improve your trading. All right, number one, let's hear from Nick on his general views of the market last week. I mean, what did you think about the markets? Pretty wild Monday, Tuesday, but then it just kind of quieted down the rest of the week well everyone was looking forward to that uh, government job report non-farm payroll report on Friday which um, apparently was better than most people expected but again it's an anemic number just 173,000 new jobs created while that's not really important to my work what's important um, is the cycles that are in play at the moment and um, throughout history March has been a very very pivotal month uh, especially when you have a long-range and short-range cycles coming together. So if you take a look at any year and you just go back and take a look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the S&P 500, scroll back through a chart, you're going to see that the month of March throughout its history, uh, throughout the market's history, has been a very, very pivotal month. And I think uh, traders want to be aware of that now. We did see a big spike initially on that job news, um, and it took us to a certain level on what I call the dollar-yen carry trade and once that level was hit uh, we saw the markets reverse back down to the other side so I think traders right now really should be alarmed be aware uh, of the dangers that are out there and 2014 is not going to be uh, like 2013 was a straight-up year there's gonna be fit this year will be filled with volatility and you, you're really gonna need to know what you're doing to navigate through these waters 
Yeah, I think that that is interesting, and it's something to that's that every trader or if you're into the market significantly you want to be aware of is that the markets really do go tick for tick with that dollar yen chart. And again, if you type it in on Google, you'll all be able to pull it up. And uh, you know, many people think that the markets are running off of earnings or off of this or off of that, but it really does come back to that dollar yen chart. Now, just a couple things about last week that I thought were fascinating. Number one, we saw Monday, right? So after Sunday's show last week, we saw a major sell-off on Monday. Everyone was kind of doom and gloom because of the Russian-Ukrainian situation. And just to kind of show you how insignificant news stories can be, I think it's important to look at what happened there. So the big sell-off Monday, and then Tuesday, it was as if, as if it did not even exist. And the markets literally negated, and then some, to the upside, the market fall from Monday. And again, it's amazing because if you really look at what's going on, there was nothing different in the Russian-Ukrainian Crimea situation. It was all the same. Uh, you still had boots on the ground there. You still have boots on the ground this weekend. But the markets just decided based on other factors that it was not important. And you can look at the dollar-yen for being a, a key player there as well as some other factors. So Tuesday we had that big reversal. Wednesday the markets kind of took a breather. And I always talk about this, Nick and I both do. You have what we call a hangover effect, and oftentimes after a wild couple trading days, and this actually is psychological, uh, and it goes even to the root of the individual traders on Wall Street. I mean, think about you, all of you guys working your 9 to 5s or working any job that you work, and you just have a couple crazy days. You're super stressed. You're so active. You're so busy, and then all of a sudden you get a day where things aren't as crazy, and you just sit back and you say, listen, i, I got to take a breather here. And that's what the markets did, and that's what a lot of traders did on Wall Street on Wednesday as the markets had extremely like volume and went sideways so that was Wednesday Thursday we came into the trading day with a small gap up and throughout the day we kind of went sideways again another very light day oh, oh, uh, Honestly, we ended a little bit lower than the gap up highs, but still green on the day. And then Friday, we opened at new all-time highs on the S&P 500, only to sell off and basically close flat again. So Monday, Tuesday, wild action, and Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, pretty quiet action. Overall, for the week, I think the S&P was up, you know, three-quarters of a percent or something. It was basically a flat week. But again, the markets continue to show us resiliency. Uh, I think it's, it's continued... Uh, kind of the markets trying to, or I shouldn't say markets, maybe the institutional players playing their game, trying to coax in those last few uh, mom and pops, the average investors. I mean, what do you think about that, Nick? I mean, you know, I talk about the game sometimes about how the only way these institutions can really get rid of the long positions that they've accumulated for years is if they have the mom and pops come in. I mean, do you see some truth behind that? Oh, absolutely. I, I think that um, you're seeing institutional distribution happen almost every day right around uh, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and then the light volume floats the markets higher into the closing uh, into the closing price. Remember, these big institutions must distribute stock in stealth mode. They can't do it in, in just a market order sell. They have to do it in, in bits and pieces. So I, I believe that they're distributing stock right now, especially um, as we talked about before the program with uh, margin uh, levels reaching all-time highs. I mean, this is this is getting to be a little bit scary at this moment. Yeah, one one thing just to go over, I was just talking before we began the show with Nick about a couple key headlines that were crossing over the weekend. And I always find it fascinating when these headlines cross over the weekend when no one's paying attention. But one of them was that, and I talked, interestingly enough, the last time I brought up the margin debt, it happened to be in early January when it was kind of made out that it was at a new all-time high. And margin debt, folks, just again to give you a little definition, that's when the average investor borrows money to buy stock. So it's almost like taking out a loan on your credit card or using your credit card to purchase it. I mean, you have to pay it back eventually uh, because it's it's a loan and it also carries an interest rate. So, I mean, there's you have to really believe that the markets are going to go higher. And, and one thing that we've always learned is that when the average investor believes something so much, it's honestly usually the opposite. So just a headline that crossed a little while ago was that uh, U.S. margin levels hit a new all-time high. And just to go over this again, the last times periods, the last time periods they were at all-time high were 2007 and then also before that 2000. And if you look at the market's activity in the following years of that, it, it is pretty scary overall. A couple other headlines that I thought were, were pretty crazy and I, I, actually shocking to me in some way. We saw China exports uh, down 18.1 percent from a year earlier uh, in February. And again, you know, if you guys have been paying attention to what I've been saying, and I'm sure Nick will talk about this a little bit, but we've we've seen kind of the shadow banking kind of 
crazy bubble brewing in in kind of fun, the financial side of China. And I don't know if you, you have much information on that, Nick, what you were thinking about what's going on there. But it, it is pretty scary because it almost makes, I think it almost makes the U.S. in 2007 look like a small fish. You know, when you're dealing with uh, an economy with 1.3 billion people in it, um, it, it is pretty frightening. And, and don't forget, we consume predominantly uh, most of their most of their goods that they produce. So uh, right now, when I look at the money flow uh, in the in the Shanghai Composite, I, I see downside for uh, the Chinese stock market, and uh, that's going to be real problematic not only for China but for the rest of the globe because. Uh, if you if you can't feed 1.3 billion people, uh, it's only a, a, time, a matter of time before civil unrest uh, occurs, and I, I think um, they're they're going to definitely see their their amount of problems coming up very shortly. Mm, yeah, and, and that is true in, in regards to civil unrest. I mean, if you just there, there's been more and more kind of of that I've been noticing. You know, more and more news stories about the pollution in China and how bad it is, and how you know literally you're seeing people walk the streets with gas masks masks on because the pollution is so horrendous. And again, um, for health purposes, for their system to stay afloat, they need those people behind them over there in China. Uh, so just a couple other things I noticed. So number one, that that export number, and again reported over the weekend. You know, not hitting Sunday night when the futures are open, but just reported over the weekend, 18.1% uh, decline from a year earlier. Uh, crude imports fell 18% from January to February. And you got to wonder, what's going on there with that import number falling? I mean, what in one month is going to create China to import 18 18% less crude oil? I mean, is, is there something brewing there even more so? And again, that shadow banking issue and potential collapse is definitely looming. Um, CPI in China up 2% year over year. That's an inflation gauge, so that could also be something that is jumping up there. But those are just a couple little odds and ends that I thought were interesting over the weekend that I think people should pay attention to. And again, the media, the financial media here in the U.S. is not even talking really about China. I don't know if you've even heard about it, but it's really not, right? No, it's, it's on the back page of the, uh, back page of the newspaper. It, it, it'll never be front and center until a real crisis occurs. And what people don't realize is that in 2007, late February 2007, I know you and I, Gareth, uh, remember it quite well, the day uh, the stock market here crashed over 500 points. That was uh, before 500-point down days were common. Um, that all started in, in, in China. And, uh, you know, people have to realize that what happens abroad now will affect all of the markets. Uh, we are not immune uh, to any any market going down. I mean, just look at uh, what happened uh, in Europe uh, a year ago or two years ago. I mean, any time a crisis brews in Europe, the markets here are affected. Just think about China now, which is really the one country that produces 90 percent of everything we consume. Uh, there will be problems. Yeah, so I mean that's that's a great point. It's a global economy, and and ultimately, um, as much as we may think and we may live in our own kind of bubble over here in the U.S. Uh, in terms of financials and and investment, it absolutely is global. I mean, just think about what China owns in terms of dollars. I mean, how many trillions do they own of our dollars now? They they own quite a bit, and they own um, you know they have a lot of our debt. And once if something ever happens, just say with this Russian crisis and China takes sides and they start to you know, dump our, our U.S. treasuries. I mean, we are in a world winner problems here. Um, the Federal Reserve, which owns most of our treasuries, but remember, they just print money. So uh, they're already, already sitting with $4 trillion on the books there. Uh, this, there's, there's a lot of problems that are brewing this year, and I think we're going to see some of them really start to occur uh, very, very soon. All right, so what I want to do now, folks, we're going to take a little bit of a break and uh, just step aside. But when we come back, we're going to go over uh, trade alerts for the coming weeks. Nick's going to tell us if he likes any charts out there and what he thinks of the market in the coming week and how can we prepare and make some money this week. So, again, folks, my name is Gareth Soloway, Chief Market Strategist at InTheMoneyStocks.com, and I'm with my partner here, uh, Nicholas Santiago, Chief Market Strategist at InTheMoneyStocks.com. And we'll be back. This is In The Money Stock Market Action on 820 AM News Talk Radio. The ultimate convenience in organic food delivery is at your computer. The Green Polka Dot Box is America's first choice for home delivery of organic, natural food, personal care, and pet products. All of the non-GMO verified foods, coconut products, and vegetables at deep, deep discounts. Go to greenpolkadotbox.com slash radio to see daily specials from brands you're familiar with, such as Bar Harbor, Amy's, Eden, Enjoy Life, and many more. Hundreds of brands to choose from, all delivered 
deliver to your door on time at your convenience. No more hassle running around town to try to find your favorite natural and organic foods or personal care items. Your pet will love the variety and healthy products. Go to greenpolkadotbox.com slash radio for a food delivery service you'll use many times over. Green Polka Dot Box, fueling the food revolution. Green Polka Dot Box is endorsed and featured on News Talk Florida and sportstalkflorida.com. Saturday mornings at 7 on AMA 20 News. From the law offices of Joseph F. Pippen Jr. and Associates, it's Legal Talk with host attorney Catherine Holt. All about Florida law. Legal Talk will make it your pizza. Are teaming up to give away tickets to the Yankees spring training games. You and three guests can catch the game and enjoy a free pizza. Register online at westshorepizza.com for a chance to win. That's westshorepizza.com for your chance to win. No purchase necessary. Necessary. Contest ends March 28th, and good luck. Here's Gareth Soloway with more In the Money Stock Market Action on AM820 News. Welcome back, everybody, and great to be with you here on this uh, Sunday. A couple things I want to go over now. First of all, I want to take a look at last week's trade alerts. Let's decide how much and, and see what the outcome was there and how much money will be going to charity this week. Right now, it's at $1,000.50 for the quarter. And again, the quarter ends at the end of uh, March. So at the end of March, I'll be writing a check to uh, Metropolitan Ministries in Tampa. And again, good, good work for charities and try to help out everyone we can. And remember, folks, as you're making money on these plays, and people have been making quite a bit based on these alerts. I think averaging probably about 4 to 5 percent a week. Um, I'm hoping you all are giving a little bit back as well so we can keep the good times rolling here and uh, the karma keeps helping us out and making the good calls. So uh, number one, last week uh, overall the markets kind of, I was expecting a little bit of a pullback last week overall. We didn't get it so we saw most of the plays go against me by about 1 percent on average. So again, that's the nature of the beast and not one of my stronger weeks but bottom line is if you've been making 4 to five percent every week and then you're down one percent this week we'll just chalk it up to a pause in the great calls so number one SDS I gave out last week and again that was a two times short on the S&P and obviously the S&P was up about one percent on the week so that means SDS was down about two percent QID NASDAQ was a little weaker this week, so ultimately QID, which is a two times short the um, NASDAQ 100, and again, you'd be long QID, that was down just about half a percent for the week, so a little bit of a drop there, basically a flat. Uh, Facebook overall uh, kind of chopped around, was up early in the week, and then started to collapse later in the week, and that came down about one and a half percent for the week. PRGO, flat on the week. Uh, literally to almost a penny flat, and win was basically up a couple dollars for the week, and again, that's about 1.5%. So if you average it all out, it comes out to be about a 1% decline after last week. I think we, we captured about 4%, the previous week about 5%, and so forth. So again, we'll continue with the track record being stellar and just mark the week down as a small negative out there. All right, a couple things to go over here now. What I want to do is get into the new picks on this week because, again, I think we have some key ones. I know Nick has a chart that he wants to go and I'm going to kick it right over to him right now and let him talk about his favorite play for the week. Yeah, I'm looking at a potential short play on Apple Computer right at 549. I know the stock is trading at $530 today, but for this stock to move up 15 points or so, uh it's really not a big deal. Um the stock may be shorted even sooner if you're an aggressive trader, but I don't see the stock at all getting above 549 and ultimate downside target on this would be 465. So um, the downside target is very, very good. Uh, you have a nice, nice uh, pattern here, bearish wedge forming on the chart. I'm um, looking for Apple to drop down to the 465 level. It is currently trading at $500 and $530.44. Um, you put your stop basically uh, right above the 555 level uh, hard stop. Uh, this way, there's, there's no confusion. But ultimately, this, this stock is, is really setting up to go sharply lower in the near term. Very nice. Now, so just to go over it, that would be a short on Apple if it, at a, with a limit order. So limit order at what, what price again? Uh, 549 
549. All right, so only if it gets to 549 on the upside. So it has to go up to about 549, which is 15 points or so, and then your short would be initiated, folks. And again, uh, that's important to understand. We, we're, you know, again, I understand that a lot of out, a lot of uh, listeners out there are not necessarily experts at trading. So we want to make sure you understand exactly what that call is for. And again, it has to rise uh, this coming week to that level, 549, before we look for it to decline. Excellent. That one's a good one. Yeah, I love that. Uh, a couple I'm going to give out. I'm going to stick with basically what I've been doing here, folks. So last week we didn't see performance out of the S&P and the uh, QYDs and so forth. So we're going to stick with it. I'm going to continue with long SDS at $28.29, $28.29. And we're just going to take it from Friday's close. So long SDS, $28.29 per Friday's close. Long QYD, which again, these are the same trades from last week, folks. So we're just going to continue with them. And that level, $55.43, $55.43. And then short Facebook, continue to hold that. I think that one, again, is due for a very nice decline. I love the price action, especially on Friday. Stock was down over a dollar when the markets were basically flat. So it's really showing some weakness. And again, the stock has had a meteoric rise, although the market has as well. And we're going to use that as a short at the closing price from Friday at 69.80. I'm adding two other ones. We're taking away Win and PRGO and adding in a short on American Express at 93.86 as of Friday's close and a short on DuPont, DD symbol, and that's at 67.24. So, again, just to go through them briefly one more time, long SDS at 28.29, long QID at 55.43, short Facebook, FB, 69.80, short AXP, 93.86, and short DD at 67.24. All right, so that gives you a setup going into um, to next week, folks. And again, I think both Nick and I would agree that the markets are on borrowed time at this stage of the game. I mean, could we see Nick a, a fall as early as, as next week? We could start seeing a fall as soon as Monday. Um, there's, there's, there's really not a lot left to this market as far as I'm concerned. Uh, cyclically, we're within range. Uh, it's hard when you have big cycles to pick point, pinpoint it to the day unless you have numerous cycles all coming together. This time around, I only have about three. Um, but that puts us within a three, about a three-week window. So we, we should start dropping shortly. Now, now overall, you know, in the couple minutes we have left before the next break, I mean, you know, we always, you and I, charts are second nature to us. I mean, this is what we live and breathe. But like discussing why, why would an average listener, you know, someone at home who's who's trying to figure out what to invest in, why would you want to pay attention to charts versus fundamentals? I'll give you a real good example. How often has has someone bought a stock because they thought? There was going to be such great news. I'll give you a great example. Years ago, a lot of people bought Sirius Satellite Radio uh, because Howard Stern was going to be part of the program. And the stock had already run up into that announcement. And all of a sudden, Howard Stern joins the group and the stock starts to plummet. So often the, the, the market already knows. The market is very, very efficient. It already knows what the news is going to be, whether it, it, it's announced or not. Somebody out there knows about it. And, and the stocks run up in anticipation very, very often. So when everybody's looking at the same thing, you have to be looking at the other side of the trade. That's really the only way to survive in this business, and it's very, very difficult. But we see it time and time again. You and I, I mean, I, I can't go over the amount of examples or times that we've seen stocks run up, and then the public jumps in and, and only to find out that the company reported great news, great earnings, it's stellar. But it just dropped 15, 20 yeah. percent. I also think like that's a good example of the game. You know, so these institutions, you're naive if you don't think they know these announcements are coming. They know the news is coming. So that's where they're going to have the advantage on you. You have to accept that. So when a stock is running up into a projected news announcement, you have to understand that they've already positioned themselves long. And if you're going to buy on the announcement, you're buying just as they're selling. And you never want to be on the opposite side of these big institutions, folks. It's just the nature of the beast. If you're on that wrong side, you will be literally on the wrong side and lose money as the stock goes against you. So always remember that, folks. Um, that's why I think the charts are key, because that's the one thing that you're on an even playing field with an institutional trader. They read the charts just like you read the charts, and by doing that, you can make money. All right, folks, we're going to take a break here. We'll be right back in uh, about a minute or so, and we'll get right into a great guest star and looking forward to it quite a bit.
multinational search for wreckage continues in the Now back to In the Money Stock Market Action on AMA 20 News. Here's Gareth Soloway. Welcome back, everyone. I hope everyone's having a great Sunday as we get into the second half of the show today. Uh, I want to get right into it because I'm excited to have him here, folks. It's my pleasure to introduce a great man to you today. He was the former chairman of Princeton Economics International, and he developed the economic confidence model, which has helped him predict major stock market collapses across Across the board over decades. He has led the fight to help the average investor understand the global economy and what is truly going on behind the veil of our government, the Fed, Federal Reserve, and other big bodies. I'd like to welcome Martin Armstrong from Armstrong at ArmstrongEconomics.com. How are you doing today, Martin? Oh, very good. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's a pleasure. I'm joined here by my business partner and chief market strategist, Nicholas Santiago. Glad to have you with us, Martin. Um, nice to hear you. Now, uh, first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. It's, it's truly a pleasure. And I was hoping you could give uh, our listeners a little bit of a, an insight into your economic confidence model. What is that? Well, actually, it's, a, it's the business cycle, which everybody ha respects that there, it exists. Uh, and what you have to understand is that Marx and Keynes, uh, everybody acknowledged there was a business cycle, and their theory was, well, we can control it and flatten it out. And even Paul Volcker came out in 1979 with a, with a piece he called it Rediscovery of the Business Cycle because all this stuff didn't work. So uh, it really what drives the economy is <clears throat> confidence, and that's it. And the Fed and, and all the various governments, they try to talk up markets. You know, we're going to stimulate, we're going to do this. It's all basically to try and uh, reaffirm the confidence within the public so they will do something. Uh, if they don't have confidence and they, they will hoard their money and you get a, a recession and people save. So um, that's really what is, it's all about. People tend to think that they can manipulate the markets or the economy one way or another. And honestly, they're just like everybody else. They're running by the seat of their pants and they just talk a lot, but <laughs> mm -hmm. um, they really are not necessarily in control. Now, now, so you, when we look at what the Federal Reserve has done recently in terms of quantitative easing, printing so much money, I mean, it's inflated the stock market. I mean, is that ultimately the plan is to try to get, uh, you know, from Ben Bernanke's perspective, the average investor, the middle class consumer to feel wealthier so they'll go out and spend and create that effect? No, actually, what that I don't. Uh, they weren't really interested per se in getting the stock market going. They were. I think you're going to see they're going to get quite nervous about this because the stock market's going to take off, and they're not really understanding why it is either. Um, but when you have crazy stuff going on in in Europe with Ukraine, etc., Europe is an absolute basket case economically. Uh, you have China has not made new highs since 2007 on its stock market and is really going into an economic decline that doesn't bottom until about 2020. Putin is basically also, you know, kind of beating his chest because his economy is turning down and eventually the people will turn against government. Hmm. So what you have right now is um, significant. The stock market has, has been making new highs in the S&P, not quite in the Dow. Before, the Dow was leading. And the difference between these two is, is rather significant. When the Dow is leading, it's usually big money, institutional money, etc. And for a long time, the, the, a lot of brokers that I know were saying the retail market wasn't involved. Now, what you have is the retail market starting to get involved, which is why the S&P is starting to take off. But over the last year, you've seen a massive exodus of capital leaving you, the uh, muni bonds. Hmm. And, you know, that, you know that I would say they're absolutely correct. Get the heck out of there. Most of a lot of your municipal bonds will start to go bankrupt, more like Detroit. But. The real problem is confidence. Once you get a few more going, then they just sell the whole sector. 
So even if you say, oh, well, this one's good or, you know, their balance sheet's okay, it doesn't matter. We'll get hit. So it's like a domino effect. It, pretty much. It was kind of like with Greece. Greece got in trouble, and then what happened? They looked around and said, oh, you know, Portugal's the same. Look at Spain, Italy, France. You know, they don't pay attention until the first one goes. Mm -hmm. Then they start looking around. They go, oh, everybody's in that boat, you know. So um, it, it's pretty much the same thing. So you don't want to, you know, feel confident that, oh, gee, well, my munis are better than his. They're all going to go down. Gotcha. Um, and that's just the way it is. They, it, it's buy it or sell it. And, and they do it as a sector type thing. Hmm. Martin, I'm just curious. Um how will the Affordable Care Act or even uh, the fact that there are so many Americans in the United States on welfare, how, how is this going to affect the United States going forward? Well, right now, um, we're kind of really in what you'd have to say is the roaring, like the roaring 20s. Uh, if you look at the capital flows, capital flees from wherever you have a geopolitical event. And if you step back and look at this objectively, the United States was bankrupt in 1896. That's when J.P. Morgan became famous. He organized a $100 million mm -hmm. loan in gold. So we're bankrupt in 1896. By 1914, England peaks and starts going down. We emerge after World War I as the country with the most gold reserves. Then after World War II, we end up with 76% of the entire official world gold reserves. So all the money was coming here. And it flees from geopolitical events. So you have wars like that, you can't trust banks, you don't know where to go, money leaves. And it's been coming this way. And this is why you're starting to see the S&P rise. When you have you know, the possibilities of war, et cetera, going on in Europe, anybody over there with half a brain is going to start putting their money on the ship and coming this way. And this is why you're starting to see the stock market go up. But, okay, fine, people are going around and say, gee, I don't know, everything's not really that great. It's got nothing to do with the domestic issues right now. Mm -hmm. Eventually, um, it will peak and then start to decline probably after the end of next year. And then people will start looking around and saying, oh, look at this, look at that. But from a debt perspective, um, Obamacare and, and all the stuff that we have here is nothing unusual. Europe is, is worse, and Japan is even worse than everybody. Uh, so it... it it's part of the whole post-war indicative uh, way that they have been running governments. And unfortunately, when somebody goes to get a job, you have to have a resume. You have to show the, some qualifications. To be in politics, it's none. Do you smile nice and look nice? <laughs> we know that's the truth. So it's, it's a disaster. And... I just put on our blog because, I mean, everybody knows I run around advising a lot of governments. And that's kind of because largely it's you have to know the rules of the game. And one of the rules um, I just put on our blog is that you never put your opponent in a box from which he cannot escape. And this is what Obama's done. I've never seen any politician, in all honesty, of any country or any former administration do something as stupid as the Obama administration has just done. Hmm. Um, you do not put sanctions on Russia. So now what is he supposed to do? In order for him not to lose political face domestically, he has to stand up. You've put him in a box where there is no way out of this. Cornered him, yeah. So, and it's brain dead. You're not playing with Iran. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is completely different. And um, he doesn't respect the, the feelings in Russia. And you have to understand that <clears throat> um, Russia, its first capital was Kiev. Hmm. The yes. Mongols came in and destroyed it. And then the second capital ends up being Moscow. So this is why you have, like, 
half the country is, is really ethnic Russian. And this is part of the problem. So it's kind of like, well, what if Texas decided they wanted to leave the United States? Would they invade there to stop it? <laughs> you know, right, right. It, it, you know, you got to look at things from both sides, and you know, it's the. This is not a way to diffuse it. And um, the other problem is, is that most of the energy that flows to Europe from Russia goes through Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So uh, the whole Syria thing was just nonsense too. That. You know, administrations could care less if he was gassing his own people or whatever. They really don't care. Right. Care uh, about the money. It was Saudi Arabia paying all the rub rebels to do this. Why? Because it's a pipeline that they've been trying to get through to compete with Russia. <laughs> yeah. That's all it is. <laughs> you know, and they stand up and give the same nonsense that they did to start the Iraq war. Oh, weapons of mass destruction. Okay, Korea has them too. Yeah. So does Iran, and so does Russia. So why don't you invade all of them? Yeah, there you go. Martin, you, know? you, you brought up Japan. Could could you elaborate a little bit on Japan and their debt levels? Oh, it's um, approaching almost three, you know, three hundred percent of GDP. I mean, it's the the difference with Japan is that their debt is is primarily not held uh, outside of Japan. Okay. Um, J Japan, for many, many years, uh, had exchange controls. So you could not even issue a bond in London in Japanese yen without permission of the Ministry of Finance. So this has made their debt very isolated and has allowed them to go further than anybody else in history has ever gone. How far can they go? It's basically a question of, of economics, and when, um, at this point, I, I just actually had a meeting with some, some Japanese, and, and they're domestically, they're very kind of uh, fed up with abenomics. They don't see it working. Um, <clears throat> they're more posturing against China, which is kind of really stupid, but... Um, <laughs> I think it's largely, again, it's a, it's a distraction to try and get people focused on that rather than the economy because um, there is no way out for this. Um, you know, I was uh, an advisor to, I mean, to two major entities in Japan. Um, and, you know, it's... When I testified before Congress, I mean, everybody couldn't believe it. We had over three trillion dollars under contract that we advise on, and it was like that was at the time was half of the U.S. national debt. Um, I was shocked. I was called in, and it was you know, the first one was the um, Japanese Postal Savings Fund. And when I went in, I said, okay, fine. They wanted us to, to do the advisory work on it. So I asked, okay, what size portfolio are we talking about? And they said Ichi Cho, which is $1 trillion. So I'm thinking, all right, a trillion yen. I said, this is pretty good. It's about $100 billion. They go, no, 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 no. Ichi Cho dollar. <laughs> <It's> dollar. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, just between two entities in Japan, we had a, under contract about $2.2 trillion. And um, to watch what happened, um, we, were, we developed the whole hedging program, and the government came in and stopped it at the last minute, and they said, no, 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 no. If you hedge this, you'll make the market go down. They lost, one of them lost $500 billion, I would say, within the first year. Wow. The other one, the Japanese Postal Savings Fund, which was the largest fund ever in history, was about $1.2 trillion, uh, completely bankrupt. <laughs> they had used all the money to support the Japanese bond market, and now, you know, savers go there to take their money out, and the government just basically has to print more money to give it to them. That's it. How long can economics go on? I don't really see... I think most of this stuff is going to basically start to fall apart uh, around 2016. And 
What you have to realize is that the United States is, is the only game in town. You have China going down, Japan, Europe, Russia. Right now, capital is coming here because of concerns uh, that <clears throat> the EU is going to like confiscate 10% of everybody's assets and banks. That's what the IMF tells them to do. Now you've got geopolitical war over there. You have half the municipals in Germany on the verge of bankruptcy. The banking system over there is a complete disaster. And so th there's no place to put money. And so anybody that's like in real estate they know in New York, it's all foreigners buying everything, down in Florida too, I mean, all over. I mean, China's coming in, Europe's been coming in, they've been buying real estate to get off the grid. Yeah. To get money out of the banking systems because they don't trust them. So they want a tangible, a tangible asset, basically. Pretty much. Uh, and um, they don't really trust a lot of the stuff that's going on. So, and now you add you know, the geopolitical things. So the stock market over here, you know, can go up a lot higher yet. I mean, um, you have two sources of revenue for it, and one is the capital inflows, but two is um, we advise a lot of pension funds, and I can tell you what has happened is that by keeping the interest rates so low trying to bail out the banks, they have basically screwed all the pension funds. <laughs> Most of them were uh, designed expecting or requiring 8% return annually, and they have not been making it. A lot of states have not even been funding it. So um, we have a pension fund crisis which will hit, I think, starting in 16. And so the pension funds have been forced into buying stocks because they can't earn enough money in interest rates. And a lot of them have even been going into emerging markets. So it's, it's quite interesting. Now, my next uh, question for you is going to be about gold, gold, silver, precious metals. Uh, in the 30s, obviously, Roosevelt confiscated gold. Uh, do you see anything like that taking place again? Well, it's the biggest problem with gold is the they have been hunkering down on it tremendously, um, virtually everywhere for for tax reasons, because all these governments are also broke. You have the G20 agreeing that uh, they want you know they're all going to cooperate to find you know who's hiding money, and uh, they've been shipping. Um, because they put all kinds of regulations on various silver and things like that. They've been painting silver bars gold and shipping them into Switzerland because that's the only way they can get it out of Europe tax-free. <laughs> uh, then they take the paint off it. That's amazing. Um, it's been quite alarming um, because, honestly, I mean, I would say that there's no place you can have gold now as far as storing it in a facility that the government doesn't know about. Mm -hmm. And they're tracking everything. I know guys that are in the, in the business of refining. Mm -hmm. They have to report to the government every ounce that comes in and every ounce that leaves and where is it, where is it going. So basically gold is stamped right now. The government has a track, basic an RFID tag on every, every ounce in and out. Pretty much. And, and economically at the banks they're doing the same thing so um, I mean we have employees in Europe and it's extremely difficult to pay them I mean it's you have to go through all kinds of litany here well why are you giving this individual money well he works for us you know <laughs> um, I have a friend in in Switzerland I mean it's getting crazy all over he got a divorce the two of them had their money in one account, so okay, fine. So she's is taking her half and going to another bank, and they couldn't transfer the money. They had to go to the bank with the court papers, divorce papers, and explain why she's taking half the money out of the bank. Um, you can't wire three thousand dollars out out of the country um, unless it's to a business. And I was going over to Singapore. And so 
I had a you know a friend there. I said here you know I sent him fifteen thousand bucks. I said here get me you know um, apartment car whatever. I should just get it ready for me when I come over. And I wired him the fifteen thousand bucks. And then I mean we were friends, so I get there and he goes, you know that money never showed up. I said what? I called the bank. I said, you know, you should have told me before. <laughs> that would help. <laughs> it would have helped rather than waiting for a couple of months. And here HSBC had the wire all the time, and as soon as we put a tracer on it, they bounced it back. And they would not put the money in his account because I was an American, and they have to report what Americans are doing globally, and they couldn't verify that I had no interest in his personal account. Hmm. So they wouldn't give the money. I had to write him a check. <laughs> Wow, that is something else. Now, do you think that, you know, Bitcoin, I mean, so much has been talked about about Bitcoin. I mean, is that going to be something that's viable in the future, speaking about paying people? I mean, is that something that is actually going to make it easier for governments to track? I mean, what do you think on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, honestly, the government is letting it, has let it go, mainly because that's where they're going. Um, if you, even Larry Summers came out and he said the object is really to get rid of, rid of all cash. Um, and they want everything to be electronic. That is the name of the game. And, I mean, you can go online and look. You can buy $10,000 bills from 1934 that we used to print, and $1,000 bills and $500 bills. Why is it that we've never had anything more than $100 bills since, you know, the, since the 60s? Mm -hmm. Because largely they don't want people to have cash. And um, that's the issue. And if everything's electronic, then they feel that they'll get every penny of tax on everybody and you're not going to be able to hide anything. Wow. Now, just uh, lastly, do you have any recommendations? I mean, we have a lot of lis listeners who are just average investors. I mean, how do they navigate the next few years in this market? I mean, do you have any suggestions? Well, I think that you're still going to see the stock market rise. You're probably going to be looking at new highs at the tail end of the summer of next year. And after that, uh, I think we're going to see another very serious uh, crash and, and uh, more or less like the 2007 thing. Mm -hmm. um, but this time it's going to be probably a bit worse. It's going to be more focused in, I would say, pension funds, etc. The banks are not going to be bailed out like they were before. They're really persona non grata right now, and this is part of the reason why Obama was up there offering new types of bonds. Um, the Myra. <laughs> yeah, and this is, the way the banks have had this control, it's not uh, some uh, really, you know, giant conspiracy of controlling the world. Basically, they have been manipulating markets. They lose money every time. They, they're not good at this, but they, you know, they don't look at risk. They just figure that they always have the government in their back pocket to bail them out. So it's kind of like going to a casino and you put down a thousand dollars on red, and if you lose, you say, "Well, give it back to me. And let's go again <laughs> until I win." And that's pretty much what they do. Martin, what happened to the uh, toxic debt that the banks are holding? I, I, is it still there? Has it disappeared into thin air? And that's been largely what the Fed has been buying. Mm, so, that's what we assumed. Yeah, it's, um, that's pretty much what they've been doing. And uh, some of it has now come back. And we'll come back because the dollar is going to still be very strong and probably the only currency to put money into. Um, at this point, most people are not talking about the bricks anymore. They're all going down. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, it, this is the same thing that happened in the 30s. I mean, Europe blew itself apart, so you have to put money someplace. And the U.S. was the only game in town. Will Japan be the first to fall? Uh, I think Europe and then Japan, uh, it's kind of going to be like that Greece thing where once one goes, then they're going to look around and say, oh, you know, they're next. And then you'll then will become very rapid. Okay. Um, so I don't see a lot of time delay. The U.S. will be the last, um, but it will happen, and that's largely what Roosevelt's confiscation uh, of gold was all about was that the dollar was so high 
that his recommendations was he had to devalue the dollar because we couldn't sell anything. And that's why he confiscated gold to prevent people from making profits from it, from the dollar devaluation that he did. So he took gold from twenty dollars to thirty five, which is a fairly aggressive devaluation. Yeah. Definitely. Now, um, and that's what he did. Now, just, just to finish up, now, if our listeners want to follow you, how do they go about doing that? How do they follow your updates and your information? Uh, you can go to armstrongeconomics.com. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Thank, thank you, Martin, so much for joining us today. Honestly, we, we both look up to you very much, so it's, it's a pleasure to have you here today. And, again, thank you for coming on our show in the Money Stock Market Action today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Take care. Have a great day. Thanks again, Martin. Thank you. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break here and then be right back to end the show, wrap it up. Uh, this is In the Money Stock Market Action on 820 AM News Talk Radio. Get the IRS off your back now with one phone call. Talk to a live professional tax relief agent and stop worrying about your tax problems. Wall & Associates offers free face-to-face -face consultations. Our average client settles for about 10% of their tax debt. Wall & Associates has settled thousands of cases for a small fraction of what was owed. Call 800-579-5740. That's 800-579-5740. 800-579-5740. Not a solicitation for legal services. Are you or someone you know suffering from hemorrhoids? Is it causing you discomfort and embarrassment? Now there's an answer. Introducing Ultroid, an FDA approved procedure to treat hemorrhoids. There's no surgery, no anesthesia is needed. It's done in the doctor's office and you can return to work immediately. The procedure is covered by most insurance. Call 813-920-9799 or go to do not suffer in silence.com. Here's a patient who had the procedure done. Hey, hi, my name is Michael and I have uh... Uh, struggled with hemorrhoids over the course of the last two to three years. I had an option in terms of finding some relief in a non-surgical way. The results after my very first treatment were um, absolutely amazing. I have been very, very happy with the change in, that I've been able to make in my own lifestyle and uh, would recommend it highly to anybody who's who's been suffering with this condition. Call 813-920-9799 or go to do not suffer in silence.com. Call today, 813-920-9799. The pitch, Grandison lines one a deep right, and that ball is gone. Sports Talk Florida, AM 820 News, and West Shore Pizza are teaming up to give away tickets to the Yankees spring training games. You and three guests can catch the game and enjoy a free pizza. Register online at westshorepizza.com for a chance to win. That's westshorepizza.com for your chance to win. No purchase necessary. Contest ends March 28th, and good luck. Here's Gareth Soloway with more In the Money, stock market action on AM820 News. Welcome back, guys. So as we wrap things up today on this Sunday, just a couple things to remember. All right, we've seen a lot of little headlines crossing over the the news waves this weekend that could put a little bit of a damper on this market. Be ready for a little bit of downside action in the coming days, all right? There's a lot of possibilities, Ukraine, Russia, China, and so forth. And again, lastly, let's continue to follow things uh, on the charts. Remember, charts are the key. Start taking a look at them more so. We'll teach you more next week. This is Chief Market Strategists Gareth Soloway and Nicholas Santiago in the Money Stock Market Action on 820 AM News Talk Radio. WWBA Largo, Tampa Bay. Keep it here and stay.